Hey everybody, welcome back to Ripple Live. We have not been here for a little while. We've been really busy, had a lot going on. Uh, I'm Mark, I'm here with Steve. Hey Steve, how are you? Good, Mark, good to, good to see you. <laughs> yeah, good to see you too, man. Very good, I'm, we're glad to be back. We're excited to have a, 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 an exciting hour of uh, Final Cut Pro tips. So this, that's what this show is about, is about talking about Final Cut Pro 10 and related applications and topics. Uh, and we're here to answer your questions. Um, and Steve will explain a little bit more about how this whole thing works. Yes, so you have a chat window and you go ahead and put in your questions in the chat window. We try to answer them in the order that they appear. And there's also a feature called a super chat and it's a little button at the bottom, a little dollar sign if you wanna uh, donate to the show on any amount that uh, would be appreciated, help support the show. And uh, what that does is it pins your question to the top. So we'll answer the Super Chat questions first. Um, if we don't get to your question for some reason, it's not like we're deliberately ignoring it, it's just there's a lot of questions that get posted and we have to go up and down. So if we don't, just post it again and uh, we'll, we'll try to get to it. So we'll do the best we can. Um, we like answering your questions and this is the, the best part of the show is being able to interact with you live. So uh, lots of things have been going on. Um, let's see, I, Mark had just, uh, oh, I'm talking about me now, not you. You can talk for yourself. Uh, I, I've been working for the past almost six weeks on a Resolve tutorial because I'm getting a lot of requests for it. And in the next couple of weeks, when we, I'm going to be releasing a full like soup to nuts Resolve from importing to editing to color, color page, work on Fusion, the whole thing. And that's pretty much been taking up my entire summer because <laughs> it's not like I'm creating one tutorial for one app. I mean, you think about Resolve, it's, there's five separate apps built into it. And I'm super excited about it and it'll be, it'll be coming out in the next two, two weeks or so. And that's a good lead in to what my tip's going to be because um, most of you know that we're fans of Resolve and we use Final Cut primarily for editing, but Resolve for color grading and a lot of other things. And I want to show you a particular tip today that you'll find really, really useful if you ever need to export a bunch of clips from your timeline. Uh, I get a lot of questions about that, like, hey, I've, I've got all these clips in my timeline and they're color graded. I'd really like to be able to spit them out as individual files. Well, Final Cut Pro 10 won't allow you to do that, but you can do it in Resolve very easily. I'm gonna just walk you through the workflow. Um, you're, so we get a lot of questions about why do you use Resolve? Well, here's just one of many reasons why you would want to put Resolve into your workflow. And you'll, I think you'll really appreciate this. And you can go out and download the free version and, and do what I'm about to show you. And you're like, it's, it solves a big problem. Okay, so let's, uh, let's jump over to my UI real quick, Travis, and we'll take a look. So I have this string out here of, uh, of Leslie Porterfield in her record-breaking record speed run at, in uh, the Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah. And you see it's just a string out of clips. And I've gone through the clips and I've added a, a base grade to them, like this clip here has a base grade on it. And you can do that and you could send your clips over to Resolve with the base grade applied. We'll talk about that in a moment. But I wanna get all these clips out as separate files. Perhaps I wanna upload them to stock video sites or what have you. Um, I just wanna have individual clips. I don't wanna export the entire timeline. Well, Final Cut does allow you to export the clips in the browser. So like you could select a bunch of clips, of course, and go file. And she says there, share five clips. I can share those clips, but I can't share them from the timeline. And that's kind of a problem because if I wanna grade them, I, I have to like then put that into a compound clip and then grade it and then export. It's just so many steps. So I'm gonna show you how to do this very quickly using Resolve. So I have these clips. And the first thing I want to do is go to the file menu and choose export XML. And it's, it takes on the name of the project, in this case, Salt Flats. And I'm just going to export that or save that to my desktop, just an XML file. Just takes a couple seconds. And I'm going to jump over into DaVinci Resolve 16. And you want to start and resolve. This is the what's called the project manager. It's where you start. Start. This you can think of this as like a, a vault for all your projects. It's, that's what it is. Just a vault. I'm just going to open this untitled project. It's already open. Now I want to bring in that timeline from 
from Final Cut Pro 10 using the XML I just exported. So I'm gonna to go to the file menu, choose import timeline and choose import AAF EDL XML or, or shift command I. Then I'm gonna to navigate to where that XML file is, which is right there, and I'll click open. Now, the first thing that you're gonna deal with is this load XML file of this window here. And it's important to understand a couple of things about this, this window in that you wanna make sure that your time re line resolution matches the project resolution from Final Cut. And because it came from an XL, um, XML file, this should all match up. Um, the one area that's really cool that I don't believe other NLEs do uh, is that if you do a base grade in Final Cut, you can check this box here, use color information. And so, you know, basic things like contrast and color will come across into Resolve. So they'll, they'll already be there when you when you bring the, the project in. So I like to leave that, that check box checked and everything else is pretty much just leave it the way it is and click OK. And immediately that project that was in Final Cut Pro 10 is now in Resolve. You can see there are all my clips. There's pretty much, in, no, not pretty much. They are in the exact order that they, they were laid out in Final Cut. So even this clip here, this is that first one I said I did a base grade on. All of that color information from Final Cut Pro 10 came into Resolve. And if I go to the color page for a moment, you'll notice that if I toggle on and off the node for that, for that particular clip, notice there's my base grade that was sent from Final Cut. So I'm, I'm ready to export, essentially. So I'm gonna go over to the Deliver page. And over here in this section here, I just set up how I want the files to be exported. So I'll start by clicking this ProRes icon. I wanna export in ProRes. It's, it's, you can export in different, in different codecs, but I want the highest possible quality. So I choose ProRes. And notice here, there's you can choose how you want to export. Notice I have a, an item here that says file. If I check this box, so this little radio, it says individual clips, it will now spit out individual clips of my timeline. It says right there. Also, this is great. It'll, you can maintain the original source names of your files from Final Cut. So I definitely recommend checking source name. So you get the exact same source file names, and individual clips. The last thing I want to do is, is tell Final Cut, excuse me, tell Resolve where I want these, these movies to be rendered to. So I'm going to choose Browse, and uh, go to Desktop. I believe I have, let's see, I'm going to select the Desktop. I'm going to create, oh, I already have a folder called Exported FCP Clips. I'm going to select that folder, and I'm going to click Open. So I've told Resolve where I want those files to be. So next, I click this button that says Add to Render Queue. And as soon as I do that, it adds it to this Render Queue over here. You gotta think about the Deliver page in Resolve is pretty much a Resolve's version of Compressor. It's built into the app. So I have a, a Render Queue where I can set up a bunch of jobs. And here, it uh, tells me that I'm about to export 12 clips, okay? So last thing I do is I click this button here, Start Render. And the playhead goes over the clip and it's generating all these ProRes files. And it's pretty quick, done. Now, if I right click on the job over here, I can choose Reveal in Finder. And you'll notice here, all those clips are, there they are, all of them, with the original file names from Final Cut Pro 10, all in ProRes and the clip that was color graded, I'm gonna find which one, which one it was, <laughs> there it is. And the clip that was color graded also shows up. So you basically can send your Final Cut Pro timeline over to Resolve with color information, all the color, what they call CDL, um, color decision list, goes over to Resolve and then use the deliver page to spit out your movies. It's really, I use this all the time because I can't get out color graded clips from Final Cut Pro 10. And now I've just shown you how to do it using Resolve. There you go. That's excellent. Steve, I have two comments on yes. uh, questions or comments. Yes. One is that, so people know you can do this with the free version of Resolve. So Resolve yes. can act basically as kind of a free 
uh, auxiliary program for Final Cut Pro 10 editors. And this is just one example of something you can do with it where you can just use it as a way to get clips out. So, and there's many other things you can do like this with the free version up to UHD. Um, yeah. So it's you know it's sort of a no-brainer. It's free. The second thing is, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that the only color corrections that will come through from Final Cut are ones that were performed with a color board. Um, that if you do color corrections with the other you know color wheels or curves or hue saturation curves, I don't believe those will come through to uh, resolve. Well, I, I can say for certain what won't come through are the masks. Like if you if you uh, do a secondary mask, either a a, right. um, a shape mask or a the color, color mask, those won't come through. I was able to do some curve adjustments and they came through. Cause- Oh, they just, did, you're just, okay. Uh, you're, you're just Maybe messing. in 16, that's new. Yeah, so you're you're just messing with the YRGB channels, really, you're just, you know, that yeah. really what the curves are is just mani just another way of manipulating your YRGB data, that's all it is. So um, it's it's a great way to do a base grade, send your own result and then spit them out. Uh, although I have, <laughs> it's interesting because I, the, the color grading tools are so good in Resolve, I probably, no, not probably, I do, just send the thing over to from Final Cut and then just do my color grading right using the Resolve tools, you know? Like, for mm -hmm. example, if you, if you cut back over here for a moment, uh, Travis, I wanna show you something. Um, like, for example, if I, if I, let me jump over to the color page for a moment. So, I play this clip. You'll notice there's a, there's a problem with it. Not a problem. Do you see how shaky it is? It's there's it's not stabilized. And if if you've been watching this show for any length of time, you know I've been like beating this drum that a stabilizer should be built into Final Cut. Well, there is a stabilizer. I should say there is. I'm yeah. Try. I mean tracking. Okay. So uh, that, that's not what I meant. I meant tracking. So like if you needed to track something. So for example, I go to this clip, and um, you know I have a stabilizer, but if you wanted to let's say track something in here, you could just send it over here. Like, uh, let's say I needed to remove that, that sticker right there. It's just a matter of uh, jumping into, you know, the windows, you know, and, set, and setting, setting a window. And then let me go ahead and uh, actually, um, oops. I'm gonna go ahead and bring the size down. I'm just gonna quickly do this to, because this has been my answer for like the lack of tracker inside Resolve is that, you know, I, I can't track, so now I can do it. I can we'll go ahead and I'm rotating it there, and so I'm setting the tracker up over that sticker. Let's say I want to remove it. Now I'm just going to go into the blurs palette and just crank up the blur. Notice completely blurred out now on that gas tank. Okay. So at this point, I can go back and then go tracker, move this playhead to the beginning, and. Uh, don't track it yet. You want to reposition that uh, blur because it's. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I should have started there. Exactly. Thanks. For, I'm glad you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, I just clicked this track forward button. I'm on. I'm. It's already set up as a window tracker here. You can see it's yep. tracking window. And now I just click this button and boom, 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 boom. And you'll notice now that within just a matter of seconds, I've tracked that blur to that tank. This is again, something I can't do in Final Cut, but I can do really quickly and easily in Resolve. So, so that's again, just, just two things that, why I think Resolve should be kind of part of your workflow. Um, anyway, so there's Excellent. one. So I did a, I did a two for there. <laughs> Great. Okay, let's get to uh, some questions. First, I sure. wanna uh, thank you to Philip for your uh, contribution, really appreciate it. Philip said he likes, he loves the recent tutorial on Blackmagic Pocket 4K. So Lee Herbert did a, a really great tutorial on the on the Blackmagic Pocket 4K. That's a new Ripple tutorial that was just out last week. Mm -hmm. If you guys are into that or even into the 6K, you probably want to check out the tutorial because a lot of that information will apply to the 6K as well. Uh, and thank you, Peter Downing. He said uh, he loves your tip there. As an archivist for our department, it will be nice to send graded versions to our library. Outstanding tip. Excellent. Excellent. Let me, I'm going to go back up top. There's a couple things at the beginning. Uh, Andy mm -hmm. Nicholas asked about a half hour before our show even started. <laughs> uh, quick question. Is it possible to set a keyboard shortcut to toggle captions on and off? I've tried and failed to do it. Can you help? Well, I tried and failed too. 
you know, you, if there's something you want to kind of set up a keyboard shortcut for, the thing to do is go into Fanica Pro Commands, customize, and do a search on the, the term to see if there's a command. You can only set keyboard shortcuts for things for which there is some command in the menu, and there is no menu command for toggling captions or specific roles on and off. You have to click on the little checkbox in the uh, timeline index. And Steve, maybe I don't know the answer to this. Maybe you do. Joel Hall said, I have a workflow in which I have compressor export an audio and video file from my Final Cut Pro 10 project. I'd like to export that audio in ALAC. That's kind of like AFLAC, right? Like the duck? Yeah. Um, Is there a way to get I, compressor to export ALAC? Well, you know, I it's funny know. because I, I looked at that and I'm like, I'm, I'm in fact, I'm looking in Resolve to see if it has, I, I'm not even sure what ALAC is. I mean, I, I've never heard of it, you know? Uh, so anyone Aflac. out there? <laughs> I really, Joel, I apologize. I, I don't know. I'm, I yeah, I'm not familiar know. with it either. Yeah, I'm looking in Resolve's um, uh, um, deliver page and, and I, just to see sometimes they may have different codecs in there besides the standard AAC, AAF, AIF, WAVE, and I don't see it in there either. So it, the bottom line is if, if the codec isn't built into the uh, foundations of the app into the structure of the app it's it's not going to be there now it's possible that you could be a third party component the for only it thing I found on yes. the web is automatic loudness control yeah he's but I don't know if that's correct yeah we Travis over here saying it might be automatic loudness control so so look, look, just guessing on this one so yeah, if you got more information, post it, and uh, we can all, we're interested to see if that's something uh, useful to yeah. know about. Uh, Dan McComb asked, I've got a camera that can generate proxy files along with the full resolution clips. There's a way for me to link them in Final Cut 10 instead of transcoding, so I don't have to go through the spend time transcoding. And Steve, I know you answered him here. You said that Final Cut actually has to generate the proxies. You can't yeah. sort of like substitute existing proxies in any way. Right. But your point is really good. You can just edit with the pro as long as the file names are the same. You should be able to edit with the proxies and then relink, right? Yep. I Although I would do, should. I would test it. I would test it first just to make sure because sometimes Final Cut is really finicky about reconnecting to different media if the number of audio channels is different or something like that. But um, so definitely worth testing. But that's a great idea. Is just go ahead and bring the proxies in, you know, there and, and work with them. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Good question. Let's see, um, C3M Production says, I'm old school, how do I learn more about Lewis? Mm -hmm. I have no idea what you're talking about. Lewis. Yeah, I don't know what that Lewis. is either. Yeah. Maybe he meant something yeah. else. C3M, if you mean something different, let us know. Uh, how do I, Andre Neves, sorry if I'm saying your name correct, incorrectly, Andre. Uh, how do I export title, transition, or log from Final Cut in order to import it and use it in DaVinci Resolve? Well, it, let's break that down a little bit. I don't know about log, but titles and transitions, if you export them uh, into Resolve, you're not going to get what you want in most cases, unless it's a standard dissolve. But any titles are not going to come through to Resolve if you export XML and bring it in. If you really want the title on transparency in order to composite and resolve, you could take that title and export it as, uh, you know, ProRes 4x4 in order to maintain the alpha channel, and then you could bring that in. Do you have any other ideas on that, no, Steve? I, I, well, I know the trend. I know it will deal with basic transitions, like, uh, like you said, dissolves, yeah, sure. and, and certain wipes yeah. uh, will work. Um, I, I'm not sure about the titles. I think it will. Bring a, I'd, have to, I'd have to do a test. I, I, I have not had success with titles coming in correctly. At least anything that has like graphics in it, if you use any right. of the built-in titles that have graphics, it doesn't understand the graphics. It doesn't understand the motion projects. It doesn't interpret them correctly um, if you just send your Final Cut project as XML to resolve. So well, you need to export the, that thing out. When you say log, I'm assuming you shot log and your, your clips are log. Well, if, they, if you're sending them over to to DaVinci, DaVinci is just going to look at those same log files There's, and it's not going to do anything yeah. to them. So you have access to your log files directly in DaVinci and then you could use uh, DaVinci's excellent built-in color management to then assign a LUT to it, um, a project LUT. So it, it'll normalize it across the timeline. So um, yeah, it's just going to deal with whatever you send it. So log, yes. And, and 
Um, definitely the, this whole conversation about raw, um, this is another reason to use Da Vinci is like with the black magic raw, you can only use Da Vinci to use to, to, to manipulate that the metadata, you can't do that in final cut. Um, yeah. And it's interesting. Hopefully, uh, eventually, we'll be able to. Yeah, they, they have to resolve this. That's got to be. Yeah. I don't, it's got to be. It's, they have to resolve this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good one, Mark. All right. Hey, Edgar Davis says, can't you do timeline exports? In other words, export all your clips in the timeline with command post and frame IO as well. Frame IO, yes, you can. You, you mm -hmm. know, you've got to pay for it. We love Frame.io, we use it all the time, but you know, Steve just showed you a completely free alternative. You have other uh, opinions about that, Steve? No, I mean, I haven't used Command Post. I know a lot of people like it. Yep. Um, I haven't played with it, but like you said, Resolve is free and it's you saw how fast it is and it maintains the integrity of the files and the file name. The, the one thing I, you know, you could use Frame.io, there, there's a couple little weird steps along the way to, to get it to do what you need it to do. Yep. Um, but you still have the problem. This is the problem I set up is if you have color graded clips in your, oh, I guess it works. Yeah, you could do that. Um, yeah, I guess you would set up markers for all the clips that you want to upload to a uh, frame IO and then start the upload. And I believe then you can't, anyway, I have to go back and, and you look stop, at it. you I don't just, need the markers, you, but you stop the upload. Yeah, you stop they, the upload. That, that's the trick is stopping the upload. Yeah. I, I believe it did. So you can yeah. export your timeline. You can choose to export as individual clips, and then you can abort the upload, and it will have exported all those clips. And you go and and grab those. Right. So that, that's certainly that's another option. Ah. Uh, oh, when the guy was asking about exporting titles, transitions, and log, Andy thought maybe he means LUTs. So you're not going to get any any LUTs applied in Final Cut to come into Resolve. You'll need to apply LUTs in Resolve. You can load any Final Cut LUTs that you have installed on your system, you can install for Resolve as well. There's just yeah. no location in the Finder where you drop them in and they'll be accessible in Resolve, so you can access those same LUTs. Yeah, in fact, in Resolve, if you want to apply, they have, there's a there's a whole like LUTs, LUTs browser, which is really great. See, if I go here, I have all these LUT, these called LUT browser. You can add your LUTs to appear in this LUT, LUTs browser. So, for example, let's see here. If I, um, I think you just click the options. Um, in there. Yeah, if the three buttons, the three to, buttons. No, if I go, yeah, can't. Um, just, yeah, get out of that window and just click, uh, cl close that and click the three dots in the top of the LUT browser. Yeah. Yeah, the options there. Isn't there a, uh, is it right there? No, sorry. I'm well, just well, leaving I'm, you. <laughs> What I'm what I'm what I'm saying is these are these are built in LUTs, right? To, that, but you can you can add your own. I mean, to to this list, so they're always here. Um, but I was I was what I was saying is if you go you go into your project settings, and um, let's see here, let's see here. There's one. If you scroll down here, look under color management, and you scroll down. Notice it says open LUT folder. If I'm going to open this up. And it opens it up on your in your Finder. All you have to do is get you your go. LUTs, drag them into this LUT folder inside here, and then your custom LUTs will automatically show up right here in the LUTs browser. Don't forget to update button. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then you're going to have to update. You're going to have to update the LUT. There's a thank you. Uh, Travis just pointed out a really good thing. Is like after you've after you've added your LUTs to the LUT folder, you want to make sure to click this button, update list, so it refreshes what's in there. And then when you when you leave this window, then all your custom LUTs will show up in this list, always right there within the LUTs browser, which I think is fantastic. And the same same thing in Final Cut, right? You can install all your any any custom LUTs you find on the internet or download, you can install as yeah. a as a creative LUTs. Yeah. And you can also install camera LUTs that are designed for specific cameras to yeah. use. And those and Final Cut differentiates those LUTs, camera LUTs and creative LUTs as two completely separate things that are used in different ways, which we've talked about in quite a bit in the past. Um, here, So Andre Niev says he meant logos, not LUTs. And <laughs> yes, you just need to export it as a clip. And if you need transparency, if it's a logo on transparency, you want to export it with in a format that supports transparency like ProRes 4444. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, <laughs> Martin Taylor, is there anything Final Cut Pro can do that Premiere Pro can't and vice versa? 
Boy, that's a long. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, uh, personally, I'm a, I, I'm personally, I much prefer Final Cut. It's just, um, and and specifically for two, I'll give two reasons: is the metadata handling is so outstanding for for being the ability to tag clips with keywords and uh, keyword ranges and smart collections and the ability to manage your media through uh, metadata. And the second is the is the trackless timeline, uh, magnetic timeline is is in my opinion far superior. Once you master it, once you get used to how to use it, you just going back to a track based system is painful when you've been editing trackless uh, in Final Cut for some amount of time. Personal opinion. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. I, I was just at a uh, Sony camera camp in Mont Montana with the all these top level YouTubers. And you know, a lot of them are using Premiere, a lot of them are using Final Cut. I had a lot of uh, Premiere people come just to check out Final Cut, say, okay, what, what's what's the deal here? What? Why should I be using Final Cut? And it was, it was really eye-opening to them. Like you were saying, Mark, if you jump over to my, um, my screen for a minute, Travis, it was really eye-opening to them that I could go into these clips and really quickly, you know, create you know, multiple ranges on a clip, you know, just in and out, command shift I, command shift O, and just, and then quickly favorite all of these ranges and then go over here and do this and say, hey, look, those are just the, that you can't do easily in Premiere. And, and, and like you were saying, the metadata at Final Cut is so good that you could do all of your essential edit decisions right in the browser, just using metadata before you've actually added one clip to the timeline. And that's really the paradigm shift for the premier premier people because they're, you know, it's there's there's a very defined way of working. You got to open the clip, you got to set an in and out point, you got to bring it to the timeline. With Final Cut, it's just you know range, range, range. You know, favorite keyword, 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 range, favorite. I mean, it's just a, it's just a different way of approaching it that's really really fast. And so, so I would fast. say it's it's. I just think the biggest difference would be how fast you can get through. Uh, your footage um, to get to the to the kernels of wheat versus you know the chaff. It's fast and it's I just find it's fun. The interface gets out of the way and can focus yeah. on editing. And Gabriel Spalding jumped in with some other things. I can't believe I didn't mention the motion integration because the motion templates, the way you can create motion templates and and bring them into Final Cut is just fantastic. Now Premiere has this dynamic linking with After Effects, which is similar but it's different. It's not quite the same thing. And Final Cut's also you know we bought it once in 2011 for $300 eight years ago uh, and have never paid a single penny for it since then with all these updates. So, um, you know, different different things. I, you know, I think if you're an editor and you're freelance, you kind of need to know, you need to know them both and you need to know Resolve, you just do. Uh, Avid maybe, but Avid's a little bit more very much focused on, uh, you know, Hollywood and high-end television Hollywood. But I think you really kind of need to know each of them. Um, but I can just tell you, people who know both Final Cut and Premiere in general really get the speed of Final Cut. Uh, I think there's a lot. I think Premiere's fine. It's great. Uh, I, I just met a lot of Premiere people, just like you, Steve, who, who don't even know what's possible in Final Cut. Yeah. So yeah, Chris Fenwick. How could you possibly go back to tracks? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it, that is a little painful to use tracks when you're so used to the magnetic timeline. But this, uh, there was a related question that Nick Bunton asked about. I've never looked at Ring yes. Vinci. You know, how much better is a grading compared to Final Cut? You, you're a grading guy, Mark. How would you respond to that question? Well, DaVinci Resolve was designed as a color grading application originally, and it's been around for a very long time. And it's it's been used to grade, I don't know, hundreds of Hollywood movies. It is it is a grading powerhouse. Um, I think Final Cut has been slowly integrating aspects of what you can do in Resolve, and, and Final Cut has become very robust, but it just, it can't really hold a candle to the depth of things you can do in Resolve. I would say Final Cut's tool set's good enough for 95% of what you probably need to do, but if you're, you know, Resolve just allows you to go so much deeper because it's got this nodal-based kind of structure and the tools are all outstanding and it just has all the, the tracking features and the power windows and the just everything the masks you can handle each vertex separately it just goes on and on and then you can integrate it with fusion the fusion page now so it's um 
Yeah, I mean, between the two, resolves in grading is resolve has got everything. Just a, more of a learning curve to to get into it. Thanks, Chris Fenwick, for the super chat. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> dude, man, got to buy you a beer. <laughs> Thank All right. you. Uh, yeah. So let's see here. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, all right. So we uh, looks like I'm just going through here, making sure that we have answered. Um, um, back to the audio. Thing, yes. It was Apple lossless audio. Apple lossless audio file. It was introduced in 2000. Oh. It was released in 2011. Open source. It's open source. So yeah, I. Um, but he says it's not in compressor. What would be uh, an alternative to that? Yeah, I'm, the, that whole you know Apple lossless audio file thing. We're gonna have to uh, look at in more more detail a little bit. So yeah, I don't have enough knowledge to speak knowledgeably on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, other questions? Um, I could do a tip if we don't have. Anything else right now I'm seeing? We've got a good crowd today. Thanks, thanks, folks, for joining us. Let us know if you've got other questions. Izzy's heading to Prescott, Arizona today. It'll be in your neighborhood. Wow, cool. Yeah, um, yeah. let me know when you get here, Izzy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you, want to do, a, do you want to do a tip, Mark? Sure. I will, let's see, start sharing Hanukkah Pro an F. Um, so I, I could, I'm going to give a little bit of a tip about um, creating uh, different versions of your project for different social media platforms, because this is something that uh, happens all the time, where you've got a, a 69 project, but then you've got to create it in different aspect ratios for Instagram or for Instagram stories or for Facebook or Snapchat, what have you, and they all have different aspect ratios. And how do you deal with that? So one thing I recommend is that you create a library that contains default project templates in each aspect ratio that you need, so you don't have to keep creating them over and over again. So you know you can always go to the file menu and choose new project, and go down to custom, and set exactly the aspect ratio that you want. So I've already done that. So here you can see I've got a 169 uh, HD 30p project. I've got a Facebook 69 1280 because Facebook prefers 1280 by 720. I've got an Instagram vertical 1.9 to 1 30p, Instagram square 1 to 1, Instagram stories 9 to 16, so the inverse of 169. And I've just given them names so I know what they do. And by the way, the I, I put the frame rate there. You can always change that frame rate if you haven't put any content into these projects. So you can just go to the modify button here in uh, the inspector and choose a different frame rate. Um, why am I not able to do it now? Hmm. Oh, maybe I put some content in there at one point because you should be able to change that. Uh, let's go back to here. I can do it if I go back to custom. Uh, so you can go back to custom and there, now you can do it. You just have to go back off of custom and you can do it. So once you set these up, let's say, you know, I've got a project here. Here I've got a different library where I've got a project and here, you know, I've got this little shot of um, I'm in this Jeep driving down this creek bed. We were recently in Mexico driving on this creek bed. And it's a 69 project, but I need to put it into, um, you know, another version. So all I need to do is go to my library of saved ones. And let's say I'll take the 916 version and I'll just drag that into this, this um, event in this library. Uh, I'll copy this clip. And I'll go into my little saved version and paste it. And now I've got that in this 9 by 16 version. If I go into the inspector and change the from fit to fill, uh, I'll fill up that frame. And now I've got my video in a 916 version. Of course, I could have pasted an entire project in here and selected all the video and changed their spatial conform type to fill it once. Once you've done that, you can manipulate it. So I can move it in X and Y if I need to reframe it because I've got all this extra material on the sides. And you can also set keyframes if you need to change that position over time. But frequently, if you've you know if you shot it with some eye towards needing to deliver in different aspect ratios, you kind of protect the center frame. And I've actually got good framing here throughout this. So that's part one of this tip is that I would just create a library of 
needed aspect ratios that are labeled that make it easy so you don't have to create those over and over again. Now, the second thing that comes up is titles. So for example, um, I created a quick title in motion uh, that looks like this. So it's just a, a couple of lines of text and I've got a little um, particles in the top right corner, a little particle emitter, okay? So in Final Cut, if I go back to my original 16.9 project and go to my titles and uh, grab that title, rip alive, here it is, and throw it in my timeline, it'll play fine here. I'll play it and there's, there's my nice little title, right? But if I, let's copy, let's uh, go to the to 9 to 16 version, and if I apply that same title, it's all cut off, right? We don't see all the text and we don't see the graphics over here. And yes, you could manually adjust this text. You can, of course, go in here and change the font size and move it around, and then I could have published the emitter position property to do that, but you don't need to do that. Here's the really cool thing about dealing with different aspect ratios with content created in motion. So in motion, I'm gonna select the project and go to the project window of the inspector. And there's something called snapshots you can select here. And there's the default, which we have now, which is 16.9, but I'm gonna create a new one called custom. And I'm gonna make it exactly the opposite, 1080. That's, yeah. 1080, thank you, by 1920. So nine by 16. Okay, and I have the same issue, it's all cut off, but check this out. Now I'm gonna click this edit snapshot button. And this puts us into rig edit mode. And if you've ever edited a rig, you know what's happening now. It's gonna record my actions specific to this snapshot. So what I'll do, I'll select both lines of texts, of text and bring the font size down. And then I'll just select this first line and bring it down. And then I'll select my emitter, which is off screen, and I'll bring it back over here and the size is a little big, so I'll choose the emitter and I'll actually scale the size of that emitter down and reposition it. Then stop reg edit mode. So now I have two separate snapshots, uh, this one for 16.9 and this one for 9.16. So I'll save that, I'll switch back to Final Cut, and now when I drop this same title back into this 9.16 project, um, it's properly interpreted, okay? It knows how to change it for this aspect ratio. If I go back to the original 16.9 and drop it in, it will automatically conform to that one. Where did I go past it? There it is. Okay, so it automatically will conform to each aspect ratio for which I've created a snapshot. And that applies to all the built-in ones as well. In fact, most of the built-in titles in Final Cut have at least one, four, three snapshot, which will get you close. Sometimes you don't need to do anything else, but it's very easy to create an additional snapshot. So two little tips related to being able to output um, your project in, in different uh, aspect ratios for different platforms. That was an amazing tip, Mark. That was freaking amazing. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> yeah, Travis Useful, loved it. Tra Travis like, yeah, Travis like, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Question, any questions happen during that? Oh well, Gabe, um, good. Gabriel liked that a lot. <laughs> Instant aspect ratio uh, interpretation. Yes. All right. Really, what is really a great. good? Uh, what is a good plugin to delete large objects? <laughs> <laughs> It's really tough to delete large objects. Uh, small objects, I'd recommend Ripple Tools Complete because we have a cloner built in there that you can remove a drone shadow or something else very quickly and easily. It works great, but a large object, you know, the way you remove it, you have to replace those pixels with something. And if you've got something on a field of grass, you can clone some grass over there to cover it up. But a large object's pretty tough to deal with. So the way you deal with that is you shoot a clean plate uh, with the object and without the object, and then you can use that clean plate plate to to remove it. Remove that building so I can. Get yeah, re remove plate. yeah, remove that building so I can get to the clean plate. <laughs> <laughs> good. Uh, Marcel good. says, "Can you tell us anything about what would be in development with Apple in the Final Cut front?" No. <laughs> Uh, or uh, what is it? Uh, J. Jonah Jameson's response in Spider Spider Man. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> right. 
Right, anyway. <laughs> well, Chris Fenwick said it. If someone knows, they won't tell. And if they tell, they don't know. Right. Ripple training is punchy. Today. All right, Ripple training is punchy. All right. Um, so Peter is Peter Downing says he, he loves your Ripple tools complete. He's using it. It's like... Awesome. Awesome, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, it's been really very, great because because you know part of part of Mark's busyness is like revamping all his plugins, and then we did uh, Title Nations, and then uh, was it Title Nations or well, Ripple it was call outs. It was call outs. It was call outs, call and then complete. yeah, and then and then your uh, Ripple's tool is complete. It's so great to have a a tracking tool built into the plugin that you can like track objects with. It's just just fantastic. And um, if you haven't checked Mark's plugin out on ripple tools complete it's it's fantastic he, he's doing some things in there he did some really cool like wizardry with motion so you could like track mask you can actually do resolve like things in uh using his plugin um i don't think he i think you showed that a couple weeks ago maybe but it, uh, yeah yeah you can track color corrections in final cut you can have a trackable yes. mask in final cut for color yep. correction so you can color correct a specific area um actually some one quite zubin schwartzman says, how do you remove dead pixels? Well, Ripple Tools Complete has a cloner in there that does exactly that. Um, and honestly, that's the fastest and easiest way, but you don't really have to buy Ripple Tools Complete because a, a dead pixel stays in the same spot on the, on the frame. So you just duplicate the track above itself, uh, mask that track down, that clip down on that, on that connected clip, and then shift it over um, yeah. in, the, in the inspector to, to cover it. That's another way to do it. Yeah. Uh, but Ripple Tools Complete includes all this other stuff, too. Anyway, um, hey, question for you, Steve. Um, mm -hmm. Limiter mm -hmm. or compressor for audio that was recorded a little hot? In other words, audio is already clipping occasionally when imported. That's from Talon 6 Arial. Well, yeah, I, what a limiter does is it's, it's like the name implies, it's, it's limiting the top end of your signal. But it's not doing anything with the bottom of your signal at all. It's so... Uh, a limiter is, is kind of like the last thing you put in the chain to make sure that everything that's coming out of Final Cut Pro is at a, at a, a level that's not clipping. You could set, you can set, it's called a brick wall because you're saying, okay, at minus three, any, any audio peak that goes above minus three, just, you know, bring that down. Just lower it by this, by this predetermined volume amount. So a limiter is great for making sure that you don't have any peaks that are going to be flagged by broadcast or any peaks that are going to you know, cause distortion. Although if there is distortion in your uh, app audio to begin with, the uh, limiter is not going to help you there. It's still going to sound distorted, only a limited distortion. So a limiter is good for bringing down the overall level. But that doesn't do anything for the overall, what's called the dynamics of the signal. Now, what I mean by dynamics is the differential between the softest and the loudest sound. So like what a compressor will do is it'll, it, it like if the visual would be, is it, it uh, brings up the volume of the soft sounds and bring down the volume of the loud sounds. It, in effect, compresses it. So it brings it in like this. So uh, what a compressor does is tame the dynamics so that if somebody's shouting or someone's whispering, you could use a compressor and level out or even out those dynamics so they have the same consistent volume level across the clip. So a compressor... I use way more than I do a limiter because a compressor is actually dealing with the tonal characteristics of the audio, making it sound like, particularly with voiceover and dialogue, it gives it more presence or more punch. Uh, so I will use a compressor. It'll be my go-to to get the overall voice sounding better. Although even in uh, the compressor built in, built into Final Cut, there's also, also a limiter built into that compressor. So you really have both. You can compress and limit uh, using the built-in uh, compressor of Final Cut Pro 10, it's actually a Logic compressor. So that's my answer to that. Um, and a related question was like, what uh, Greg Palmer is asking, uh, editing dialogue. What target peak levels do you aim for? Well, uh, you know, be, the meters in Final Cut Pro 10 are what they call uh, their peak level meters. They read peak, but they also get like an average uh, average reading. So if I play this back. Um, you can see that it's this is averaging. Well, I haven't really checked this, but you'll notice it jumps up to above minus six. Sometimes it jumps to minus seven. Part of your job is delivering is making sure that the audio coming out of a given dialogue track um, or a set of dialogue sub roles, if we're talking using Final Cut Pro parlance, is like coming out at the same level. Like 
for dialogue, and it really depends on who you're delivering to, uh, dialogue is typically delivered uh, at about minus 12 dBFS, and with the occasional peak, you know, peaks hitting minus six. So anywhere between minus 12 and minus six is a good target, uh, a, a good target for your dialogue. So we do minus 12 and minus six. So, you know, you can go a little bit larger, but large, um, a little bit louder, but this is where, this is what I'm always aiming for, for my dialogue, my voiceover is right, right there. And that's that range. So, yep. 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 Perfect. And a uh, nice job reading another question where you're answering the first question. That was impressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. A couple. So, so Zubin Schwartzman is saying that uh, his dead pixels bigger than one pixel. So that sounds like more uh, a, a worse problem than a dead pixel. Uh, Zubin, what I'd recommend is I, we need to see it. So shoot uh, an email to support at rippletraining.com and include a, include a snapshot of, of what you're looking at, a screenshot, and we can try to respond there. I'd really have to see it to respond more. And I'd actually say the same thing to J.R. Thibault. Thibault, I hope I'm getting your name right. He's saying, the sky in my videos is frequently flickering. I tried different tools with that success. It's like millions of pixels shines like tiny stars. What's the best way to solve this? Wow. Uh, well, I guess the question so, is, what's and, causing what's causing the flickering? Yeah, what's causing that to happen? Is it a, is it your lens? Is it uh, uh, what in the world is going on there? Are you shooting through a, a rainy door? window? I don't. I don't <laughs> yeah, we'd have to see it. I, I, it sounds like it's something that's going to be harder or impossible to fix, honestly. Um, but we'd have to see it. Um, Although maybe you could again, uh, send a sample. See, this is yeah. See, that's it's really interesting because like again, going back to Resolve. I would probably use one of their qualifiers to qualify just the sky and then use, they have this amazing blur tool that you could just punch up yeah. a little bit of blur and, and knock that out. So like, um, yeah. If I, yeah, so like- Another option like, is the color yeah. compressor in, in Resolve will will smooth out, it actually will, will smooth out multiple colors. If it's a color issue, that's another option is the color compressor. Yeah. I forgot about the color compressor. We that's right. Mark did. Mark is the one who did our advanced resolve color training. So um, yeah, the thing where you walk that drone shot where you're walking across the scrub brush. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that thing can be useful in, in if you really yeah. uh, use it in small amounts. Uh, Take okay. my money. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris says, like, Steve, Steve, can you show how to make an effect preset with all your dialogue effects you typically use? Um, Oh, that's sure. great! You you gave me an effect preset that that I use all the time for uh, yes. so we're consistent. So I don't. Let me see. I probably it's probably better if I show this. I have a library um, um, with a. Oh look! I have all my libraries right here. I'll bring up this one called Sound Editing because it has dialogue in it. <laughs> so so I have this dialogue. And by the way, this is what I love about Final. I I just think their roles are so cool. I can just go in here and I can just. Uh, show lane, put everything into a lane. Oh, look at that. Just organize this stuff. And then I want to minimize uh, everything else except the dialogue. I just, it's so elegant. I love that. So, so now I have this dialogue here and I've got me talking and then my wife talking and Spencer talking, but um, let's say I'm going to compress this. So I'm going to select, I'm going to go ahead and select that clip and I'm going to open up the effects browser and I'm going to go down to audio and, uh, You'll find a compressor under levels, or is it? No, it's dynamics. Or anyway, it's been a while. Um, maybe it's. Level. Is it level? You know what? There's, there's a compressor right there, and you're, oh, you've got. Yeah, you've got it. That's what I thought. Okay, <laughs> there's your limiter. There's your compressor. See, they're related. These are all related to. I don't know why I just drew a had a brain fart there, but anyway, um, there's this whole other discussion about what should you put this on the component or you should put this on the parent role. I, I did a tutorial on this. You can check it out on our website called, you know, mixing with components. You should definitely watch that. But I'm just gonna throw I'm just gonna throw the compressor on the the parent roll for a moment, and open the inspector, and um, go into the audio inspector, and then bring up the compressor compressor HUD <laughs> heads up display. So um, I, I we should do a, a we should do a tip on how to use this at some point. You know the way we use it or the way I use it. Um, but that's not the point. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna 
tweak a few things. And actually, I'm going to just choose a the built-in voice presets, which is normally something I wouldn't recommend doing uh, because there's no way for the compressor to know what uh, audio you're feeding it. So I'm just going to use a preset and maybe change the ratio a little bit. And now, let's say I get this perfect the way I want it. Just it does exactly what I need it to do. Because his Chris question was, how do I save a preset? Well, if I'm going to go ahead and close that. Right down here, notice the compressor selected down at the very bottom, it says effect, save effects preset. If I click that, it knows that I'm working with a compressor on that clip. So I'll just type uh, Steve compressor. And this could be, this. you can have, what's great is you can have multiple uh, audio effects that you're saving as a preset. So you can have a compressor and an EQ and a limiter, or what have you, all, all being stored into this one preset. And then you just simply pick, you know, your category that you want to store it in. I always like to create s specialty categories depending on what I'm working on. So I'll call this uh, um, film, I don't know, date night, whatever. That's what the thing was. I click create and save. And now that preset shows up right here. I have a special category and then there's that preset right there. So what's great is now I can take that preset that works on that clip. Presumably it should work on all of these clips. So I should be able to select, you know, all of the... Uh, this dialog and then simply double click and it's now adding the compressor uh look at that um you just yeah it's you can see it wow. added it to all to all those clips at once so that's my workflow for using presets and i just want to mention that um you know you your tutorial explains how instead of applying that compressor to individual clips like that you can turn all of those as individual clips into a role component and apply the compressor to all of your dialogue uh, at once, or just all of Steve's dialogue, all of Jill's dialogue, each separately without needing to go clip by clip. Right, yeah, if you not notice here, if I go over to the roles, uh, you can see I, if I open the role components, you can see I, I have, there's each one of the speaking uh, parts has, or had been broken into sub roles. See, so there's Steve, there's Jill, there's Spencer, they're all sub rolled. But what to your point, if I press Command A and then Option G to sub to create a compound clip, uh, now I have everything broken down into sub roles. So everything, like right here, this is all my dialogue. I can now apply that preset to just that dialogue component that includes everything. Or if I want to get really fancy, I can go over to the inspector and let's see here. I'm select. Select that. Instead of roles, I can say, show me sub roles. And then it breaks every character into their own sub roles. So these are like little individual sub mixes that you can work with. You can drop your, your effects roles onto, your effects presets onto. So um, yeah, it's, it's great. Let me, this is a little bit big here. Um, so now if I go to my effects, there's my compressor, right? Now when I apply this, I'm applying it just to the Steve sub roll or just to Jill or just to Spencer. I really, that's, I'm, I'm now applying an, a, that preset to a specific submix, what, what, what Final Cut calls a sub roll component. I know that the, the terms get a little weird, but basically what you're doing is creating submixes as if it was a mixer and then applying that particular effect to the submix. Okay, cool. All right, I was kind of, yeah. I want to, uh, that was great. I, I love seeing that every time. <laughs> um, I just, I wanted to address a, uh, Frank Maxwell said, I'm editing a war video and I need to remove some boat, some boats, I guess. Slicks X, I mean, I think it means Slice X can do small objects. What about using a mass plugin? Well, you can, I, I, Frank, I just wanted to show you this because, and I'll, I'll do it briefly, but, um, if I can, I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, start sharing. Um, Ripple Tools Complete, just to, to, not to beat a dead horse, but uh, here's Ripple Tools Complete, and here's a, a kayaker in a boat. And if I play this through, um, Tracking. you'll Ripple see Sorry, the kayaker's hang gone. On, hang, so, hang on, hang on one sec. One sec, we ran into a, a hiccup. A little hiccup here. Yeah. Okay. Hang on, he's fixing it. There you go. Try sharing, try, sharing, try sharing again. Okay, there we okay. go. Sorry about so, that. Uh, so, do I need to share again? No, you're no, good. You're good, you're good. I'm good? Okay, so there's Let's a kayaker start, in the boat, and I've got yeah. some audio here. Let me disable the audio so you need to hear that. But there's the kayaker in the boat, and this is just a wipe showing that that kayaker's gone. 
So um, if I open up, that's a little compound clip here, but you don't have to do this as a compound clip, but here uh, I've used this uh, cloner, this in Ripple Tools Complete, to get rid of that kayaker and clone in some other pixels. So, you, you know, that's bigger than one pixel. Uh, it really <laughs> depends on the background, what you can get away with, but that's just, an, you know, one option for cloning something out as, as one of the tools. And let me just show you, uh, since we're saying it, Ripple Tools Complete right here, you know, it has, it's, it's got all these tools. Um, and the one we're talking about here is this one called Cloner. Anything that's got this outline, this black and white dotted outline is trackable in the, in the set. So that's one option if you don't, I, I slice X, sure, it can, it can track things. I don't know about removing it, but um, it can certainly track. All right. Right. That was great. I'm glad you actually pulled that up and showed that because it's so cool that you can now track these clone pixels. It's amazing. I mean, it's just, you know, for what is it? Yeah. For, is it forty nine thirty? What's it for? Forty nine dollar plugin? Uh, I think it's fifty nine dollars. Yeah, it's fifty nine bucks. But it, I don't know if you saw that. There's just so many plugins built into that set. Um, and like Peter Downing says, he's using them every day, and you'll find you'll find them really really useful okay i want to answer um uh let's see nick dick button asked if um for fixing audio do you use uh built-in tools or something like isotope and i want to address that because i recently had a client come over who was who had a bunch of footage uh shot in hawaii and um was having some issue it was not recorded very well it was some voiceover narration and it was problematic and I, I was actually not able to get it as clean as necessary with a built-in tool so I I did use isotope RX um, specifically um, there's a, a voice denoise um, and in fact let me just I'll just share my screen real quick just to show you them where I have them built in because I just I just did this um, so if you look here in my effects I have isotope installed and I have this voice denoiser uh, really came in, in handy um, They've got a declicker and dehummer, but this voice denoiser was was great for pulling out some extra noise that was in the in the background. They had they recorded very low volume, so they had a noise floor close to the so if you pushed up the voice, you pushed up the noise floor, and this was super helpful. So I, I think this um, is a great complement to have these RX these isotope plugins, um, and they keep going on sale. I would just if you don't need it right away, you know you'll get make sure you're signed up on the isotope website. I Z O T O P E, and you'll get notified when there's a sale and, and pick up, uh, you know, pick some of these things up because they're really great. All right, cool. Um, so before we sign, before we uh, sign on, sign off, I wanted to uh, show you oh. one thing that yeah, real quickly. I, well, I know we we've, we've been on a good time today. Wow. Man. It's well, I know it's like really great questions and a lot of fun. Um, I just want to show you, if you cut to my screen, Travis, we, we released a, our first camera tutorial, and we're looking at doing more of them. Um, we did one on the Pocket 4K uh, camera. We haven't gotten the 6K yet, but you know what? The, the UI, the screen, it, it's pretty much the same as the 6K. Um, but yeah, you can get this there. I just, I'm, I'm pointing this out because it just went on sale like two days ago, so if you want to uh, check that out on our website. The other thing is um, our next Ripple Live show. Um, we were doing them bi-weekly, and, and honestly, it just it, <laughs> Mark and I are just so busy doing so much stuff that it really became kind of a it was hard to do even twice a week. I can't even believe we were talking about it. We were doing them once a week at one point, but we're go we are going to continue to do them. Um, it's just right now our schedule are, 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 were challenged. So this is the next one that we're going to do, and... You know, I just encourage y'all, if you like the show, to, to you know, tell your friends, tell people about it so, um, you know, we can you know, build up the audience and, you know, really, really make this a, a really great show. And we're always interested in hearing your feedback, you know, what, what, what we can do to make the show better, um, what other software we can cover. There's just, there's just this huge canvas that, that we can do. So, October 25th will be our, our next one. Oh, by the way, anyone in New York City um, for NAB East, I'll be there at the Black Magic booth. So if you're in the New York area for NAB at the Javits Center, I will be there if you want to come and say hello. <laughs> All right, excellent. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we are at the end. We really appreciate it. We uh, appreciate all your questions. It makes this thing work for us. It's all the great questions you guys are asking. And uh, do we home visits? Sure. And we'll be selling kayaks too, Chris. 
Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you guys next time here on Ripple, Ripple, whatever this is, Ripple Live. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thanks.